Pollock, so unbreakable, aren't they? G'day guys, Ronnie Dale here, Four Wheeling Australia. Welcome back to Project Luxy. This time, we're gonna talk about vehicle insurance and protection. Not the insurance you call up and get for your vehicle, but the insurance you bolt to your vehicle. For example, the bull bar, the winch, the recovery points, and of course, the bash plate. That's what we're covering this time. For those that have been waiting quite a while for me to talk about the bar work and the winch and all that, I apologize, but there's a lot going on with this build. There are many other sections that I still have yet to cover, like the stuff on the side and the suspension and the new tires. That'll come in due course. There are also skip points down below so you can jump around, you can jump backwards and forwards in case you didn't quite track what I was talking about or you want to see something again. Let's get after it or get to it. You know what I mean. Let's start with the biggest and heaviest item I've added to Project Luxie so far. The steel bull bar. I'll go into why I chose steel over the other options later. But for now, I'm gonna talk about this bar and tell you exactly what it is. ARB bar. It's a summit bar, winch compatible, has a flip up number plate, and it has these little vents here. Well, you can open up the grill so you can get to the winch control box in here. And then you can release the winch and open the winch. That's pretty much all you need to know about this bull bar. Other than it's bloody strong, it's heavy, it's steel, it weighs 65 kilos. Fog lamps, we do have two mounting tabs in the middle. That's probably the only thing I don't like about this bull bar, it has the mounting tabs in the middle. I don't like stuff hanging up in the middle and I'll get to that a bit more as well because you can see there's nothing mounted to the bar. The flip up number plate, I'm gonna go back to this. This is for one reason, so you can get the winch in and out and the winch line's not gonna interfere with the number plate. And it's also beneficial, it's not designed, but it's beneficial for river crossings. When you go through a river crossing, the water goes in, up into your engine bay, hits the radiator and all that, and then it gets forced back out. When it gets forced back out, that's when people tend to lose number plates, potentially lose number plates. I'm not gonna say you're gonna lose yours, but if you have a flip up thing, you'll never lose it because this will flip up you'll get it to the other side of the crossing if everything went well, and you'll notice that your number plate's up. That's because the water's forcing it out. So this would actually prevent you from losing number plates. And the previous trip we just came back from, my number plate on my cruiser actually snapped because of this. So I would like to get a flippy up number plate on that later on. Anyway, we're talking about the Hilux, so let's keep moving. Why I went for steel, heavy steel rather than aluminium or aluminium or plastic or no bull bar at all. Well, no bull bar at all was no option for me because I remote travel. I just came from a trip up north, although I didn't have any close calls with any kangaroos or anything. That's the first. I don't know why, but that's the first. Plastic. I think they look ugly as, yeah, I won't say the next word. You know what I was going to say. Aluminium, also, I think they look ugly, in my opinion. If you have an aluminium bull bar, this big shiny thing on your car, sure, I'm not giving you crap, I just wouldn't put that on my own car. Not only that, aluminium is not as strong as steel. And aluminium, yeah, it doesn't weigh that much less, 33% or you know, a third less, thereabouts, roughly. Most aluminium bars weigh less than a steel. So this 65 kilo bar could have weighed 42 or something kilos had it been an aluminium bar. But it would look ugly as anything and it wouldn't offer the same protection as a steel would. In my opinion, you can't beat steel when it comes to strength over aluminium. Also, personally, I feel much more confident with a steel bar than an aluminium bar. That was how I ended up at this point. So you might all be thinking, what's the best choice for your vehicle? Well, I'll tell you what. This is the second time I'm recording this episode of Project Luxie. Now, the reason why it's the second time I'm recording it is because I ended up way too far in depth about bull bars. But what I figured is, 
I can actually do a separate video to help you guys figure out which type of bull bar you guys need for your vehicle. There are a lot more ins and outs to it than what I'm talking about here. But this is Project Luxy. It's about what I've put on the vehicle and why I put it on there. So we'll get to that another time. And if you want a bull bar awareness video, something to help you guys pick something, just put it down in the comments below. But let's keep moving. Why do I have a bull bar? It's obvious for a lot of people. I travel a lot. And it's not only because dusk and dawn and nighttime driving, it's also just in general, just driving narrow tracks at higher speeds out in the middle of nowhere. Cause you can't do 40 kilometers forever cause you never make it, you run out of fuel. Some places you're going at higher speeds down narrow tracks and you don't know if anything's gonna jump out. When it does jump out, you hit it. There's no chance of stopping. The other thing, the main thing, you're on gravel roads, something jumps out in front of you, you want to have the confidence that what you've got in front of your car is going to protect you. And I know that that's going to protect me. So when I hit the brakes to slow down, obviously, because I don't want to hit wildlife, there's a chance for the wildlife to move, but I don't want to be swerving. When you swerve, that's when people get killed on the roads out, out remote bush. And if you didn't have a bull bar, you'd probably be more inclined to swerve because you hit something, that's it, your trip's over and you could be in the middle of nowhere. That's why I have a bull bar, because I put myself at the top of that list, extreme high risk category of hitting something. But with bull bars, it's not only about protection on the highway for wildlife and things like that. It's also on the tracks. There could be a log, there could be a stump behind behind a bush. I've been there before, I've hit things. Also, you misjudge an incline, you get the wrong angle on the incline, you bump it, you got a bull bar, yeah. No problems, you just got a bit of a scratch. You don't have a crushed in front of your vehicle because you didn't have a bull bar. So those are the reasons. Why I actually chose the ARB Summit Bar in particular. I had the Sahara Bar on my old Hilux and I've had an ARB bar on my Land Cruiser before. Yeah, you just know that the ARB gear is good. They put a lot of money into research and stuff. So you know it's gonna be strong, but is it gonna look good? This one actually looks good. There are many bars for the N80 that I think are not very nice looking. And then you have some that look really awesome, but they're not that practical. And there are a number of things that you need to look out for with those fancy looking bars. One, are they actually strong? Are they heavy? If you're going for a steel bar and it's not heavy, maybe it's not as strong as what you think it might be. It may look tough, but is it tough? The other thing, these supports, if they're too far in, you may not be able to have nine inch spotties on your bull bar because there's a radar here. Now this bar actually ticks that box. It can have nine inch spotties on here. And that was important to me. You might think, why was that important to me? Because I don't have spotties on the front. I have them behind the grill. Well, one day I may want to, but more importantly, you guys. If you guys went and bought the same bar that I bought, because now you've got your confidence, because I'm confident with it, then what if you couldn't fit your nine inch spotties? It wouldn't be a very good choice. And I don't, be, I don't want to be that guy who's influencing you to buy something that's not going to work for you. So everything on this vehicle, as I've said before, has to meet criteria. And I have credibility to maintain. So this I would confidently recommend to family and friends and I'll recommend it to you guys as well because it's on the car. Everything that's on the car, unless it's being tested, is something that I would recommend. You may have noticed, there's stuff missing on my bull bar. Where's the antennas? Where's the lights? Where is everything? It's a personal preference. So don't worry, it is complete. It looks clean. I think it looks clean. Do you think it looks clean? The only thing mounted to this bull bar is a winch. As I mentioned, personal preference. I don't like having big fat aerials right in my vision, especially at night. When I'm running those lights, I don't want two fat aerials here reflecting light back at me because all I'm seeing at night when I hop into my swag are two bloody lines. I don't want to be seeing that. Also during the day, I don't like having two lines in my vision or one line or whatever. I prefer it on the roof. 
I get far better coverage up there. That's not to say you shouldn't, okay? Because this is a very convenient spot to mount stuff and that's why most accessory stores will mount everything to the bull bar. Will there be spotties here in the future? Maybe. Foreseeable future? No. I'm happy with the light I'm getting from behind the grill and from up the top there. Everyone needs a winch. It's not the case. Could I have gotten away with not having a winch? I would say yes. You just got to work a lot harder. Look, there will be some situation that I will get myself into one day where I'll be like, yeah, I wish I had a winch right now. And therefore I have a winch. I know I'm going to be using a winch. But even if for a solo traveler who travels on her own, I don't actually think they all need a winch. Because the trip we just came back from, I used the Max Tracks every single time I got stuck. I used the Max Tracks much quicker, got out. But there will be some case, as I mentioned, where the winch will come in handy. That said, however, I have already used this winch once on that trip. I get to use my winch. I'm talking to all people. That's a cool stat to have. Hilux has pulled out a Land Cruiser, has not been pulled out by anything yet. So that is a very good 100% recovery rate so far. The winch I went for is the Warn 10,000 pound Xeon, so 10,000 S. This is more powerful than a winch that's in my Land Cruiser, believe it or not. This is 10,000 pounds, the, ones in my, the one in my Land Cruiser 79, which is heavier than this vehicle, a lot heavier than this vehicle, is only 9,500 pounds. And it has worked for eight years, almost eight years. Pulled myself out of a lot of sticky situations with a lot of load on that winch. So yes, I've had to double line pull a few times, but because that winch has performed so well, that was my first ever worn winch, I've gone for this one here. I went for the Dyneema rope because to me it's safer if the rope snaps, it will recoil, but it's not going to kill anyone. That's what I prefer, and that's what I suggest to most people out there. Look, if you're a rigger, and you know what you're doing, and you have your reasons for cable, use cable. But for anyone who has limited experience or never used a winch before, do yourself a favor, just get rope. Don't go for cable, because if that cable fails, and because of you don't know what you're doing, it can potentially kill someone it can definitely damage vehicles. A cable that snaps is nasty. It's one of the nastiest things you will see. It can just rip things apart. And I'll notice because we have specifically gone and destroyed 10 winch cables just to see what could happen. It's scary. Do you need a winch? Maybe that's another video because there's a lot to talk about when it comes to winch. Bash plates, let's talk about that. Just finished an hour and a half install of the Brown Dover's bash plates. It's in four parts. Three of the big pieces cover the main part of the vehicle from the sump back to the gearbox, all that. Then the fourth part covers the actual transfer case and some vital components. So the question is, were the factory plates not good enough? Well, look, the factory plates would have offered some decent protection but the metal isn't as thick as these. So yeah, of course, that will offer some pretty decent protection, but if you wanna go on you know, some, some hard stuff where you may slip off a rock and land on a boulder or something, you put yourself into more of a situation, this will give you more confidence. So you can kind of be a bit more confident in driving some more harder stuff because all your vital components are protected by something that's much thicker than what generally use like a couple of mil thick from factory. I think this is like three mil thick, probably something like that. Now you are adding more weight. This was 35 kilos. I removed 8.7. So we're adding close to 25, 30 kilos thereabouts. So you are adding weight. So you need to justify that yourself to put a bash plate on. The main thing I liked about this particular one was plate number four. And here's why. So this is the factory transfer cache bash plate, protective plate, or sitting here. That way or that way, I can't remember now because I took it off. So as you'll see above it, this bit here, that is the whole componentry, the electrical unit that tells this thing to go into four wheel drive or, you know, low range, all that stuff. 
here, right there. That was not protected with this. This was only protecting the metal casing, and that's not really what needs a protection. Also, it had a bit of a skid plate on it, I guess. But what I do like about this, and you don't see this on many transfer coach bash plates, is this is actually covering that and this a whole lot better now. More like a skid plate. So that I'm liking. Also this wiring harness up here, that's a bit more protected. In my case here, because it's so long and flat, I can skid over things less likely of getting hung up or something getting jammed in somewhere because it's nice and flat underneath now. That is one of the main reasons why you would put something like this on. It's not all about just protection. If it's just about protection, then you can probably just get away with the factory bars, you know, the factory plates, if you're careful. But more confidence, you can take less care, and you can now skid across something. That's why I like having these skid plates, bash plates underneath my vehicle especially for IFS vehicles, because you can create such a nice flat surface on underneath and skid over things. When you have a solid axle vehicle, all you can really do is cover the front. Also, on IFS vehicles, there are a few more components, more vital things in here, and if you mess with some of those, with a rock or a stick or a stake or a log, then, you know, you could compromise your vehicle or your journey, so to say. One thing though, one thing, it doesn't marry up with my bull bar bash plate. So it doesn't marry up with the ARB one. You see here? That's loose. If I go on corrugations, that's gonna drive me absolutely bonkers. So before I head off on the next trip, I'm going to have to just do a little, add a little bar in here or something, just to drill a hole, just to join these two up. That's all I gotta do. The recovery points that I have are ARB ones, and I got them installed the same time as I got the bar installed, and that is the best time to install your recovery points, for a number of reasons. One, they're easier to get on the same time as a bar, so you don't have to do things twice later on, if you know what I mean, because if you put a bull bar on, and then put recovery points on later, you may have to take the bull bar off just to get them on. The other reason, to make sure that they both actually marry up and fit from the beginning. Now, not all bars will fit all recovery points. And that was one of the deciding factors for me to go with the ARB bull bar was the fact that I knew that ARB make rated recovery points and that they will fit with their bar. So that was one of the reasons why I decided to go for the ARB bull bar. Now Toyota do the same and there are a few other brands that will probably do the same thing as well. The other thing that I like about this specific recovery points here is the fact that they give you this card and it even states on here this card must be kept in the vehicle glove compartment. So you have it somewhere where it's handy to find. And why is this important? Because it actually tells you how to mount a bow shackle to your recovery point. And most people out there, well, I'll say 50-50 out there, would actually be doing this wrong. And you've probably seen me do this wrong in the past as well. So, again, it's always good to read all instructions. Not only does it tell you that, but it also tells you all the other basic common knowledge for us experienced four-wheel drivers that we already know, but not everyone would remember this. So for beginners or people who don't really do recoveries very often, this is what you need to go to straight away before you do anything so you can ensure that you got it right. And look, after a while, you may forget how you're supposed to mount it. That's why you keep this in the car. Very important as important as the kit itself. You've seen how you're supposed to mount a bow shackle now and how you're not supposed to mount it. But you can also see that I can use a soft shackle with this recovery point. The edges are not too sharp so you can get away with it. But this specific recovery point, they solely recommend these. They don't state anything about soft shackles, so that's another thing you need to keep in mind. Read the manual. We've spoken about the front recovery points. We're now gonna talk about the rears. On the rear, I have a Max Trax hitch receiver point. So this goes in, the pin goes in, as you'll see right now. 
You can only use this with a soft shackle. And I've used something similar to this, well, pretty much the same thing, on the Land Cruiser for the past two years, thereabouts. And I'm trying to go all my recovery gear soft, which means that if anything does fail, whatever comes back at me, or the vehicle, or whoever might be involved in the recovery, it's only gonna be soft stuff. So it shouldn't kill anyone or cause massive injuries. That's the reason why I've gone everything soft. It's more expensive, but it's better to outlay a bit more money for safety, in my opinion. If you don't have one of these, you can always just use the pin like this, but don't use your toe ball. Never ever use your toe ball. I shouldn't have to tell you that, but I'm telling you anyway. <laughs> don't use your toe ball. You can use your pin, or even better, you can use one of these and these are much easier to work with, with the soft shackle as well. There's more room and it's just easier to work with. And that's why I've gone with this. And it lives inside this box. So it's always there, it's always with me. Well, back at the workshop, I've just added the bash plate. So now all the weight has been added to the vehicle. And we're almost at the end of adding all the weight to the vehicle too, which, um, which we'll get to towards the end of uh, Project Luxie. But for now, this time round, in this episode, let's start with the bash plate. We'll start at the lowest point. That was 35 kilos. Take away 8.7, so the bash plate itself added 26.3 kilos. The bar work, I was told it was 65 kilos. I can't confirm it anywhere, so if anyone else knows, correct me if I'm wrong down below in the comments. But 65 kilos is what I'm going with. Let's remove 10 kilos from the bumper, which we did scale up. It worked out to about nine point something and all the plastic that I had to cut off as well. We're looking at 55 kilos in the bar work. But here's a, two surprising factors. The recovery points, eight kilos each. Yep, eight kilos each. So that's 16 kilos in recovery points, just on the front. Then we have the worn winch. That winch weighed in at 46.7 kilo, rounded up to 47 kilos. That means subtracting those weights and all that, what we added in this time round was 144.3 kilos. That is a lot of weight. The heaviest episode so far. 144.3 kilos added to Project Luxie this time round. And look at that tally down the bottom. It has really added a lot to that tally, but we're almost there. We're almost there. The installation process of the bull bar was an interesting one to watch. Because of the Hilux, the new one, the way it's all put together in the front, it's all one piece. So they actually had to draw a line and cut the whole bumper all the way around. It wasn't just a piece you could pull off like on most vehicles. You just pull the bottom part off and then you stick a bull bar on. No, you have to actually carefully cut it all the way. And then there's also the splash guards and stuff like that you gotta work around with. So as a DIY installation, I wouldn't recommend any bull bar for the N80. I recommend getting the accessory store to do it because if they stuff it up, it's on them, not on you, all right? DIY bull bar install for this vehicle, you can do it, but I wouldn't recommend it. What do you want to see next? The suspension tires and the body mount shop? Or do you want to see the Bronner hide? You guys let me know and I'll endeavor to get that done. There are also more things going on in the back. There's a water tank, there's a fuel tank. I haven't really dived into that yet. There's a tank underneath, there's a snorkel. But the build is pretty much done. I just haven't covered everything yet. So let me know and I'll do my best. 65% of my viewers are not subscribed, surprisingly. So get on there, it's for free. It helps the channel grow. Also, if you want some exclusive content, head over to my Patreon. All right, guys, catch you later.